Today we're answering questions from the comments section on Gleason 3 plus 4 equals 7. Now because there's 4 present, a lot of people are wondering, can they do active surveillance? If they do choose treatment, you know, do they have to do hormone therapy and what's the length of hormone therapy? If they are going to do active surveillance, can they do testosterone replacement therapy because they have low testosterone? So today we're going to cover this with Dr. Mark Schulz, who's a 30-year medical oncologist who focuses solely in prostate cancer and answer your questions. So I'm summarizing a question that came up quite often in our comment section, but patients were wondering if the monitoring system for, you know, three plus three is different than the monitoring system for three plus four for Gleason seven, because you have the presence of four, but do you need to get, you know, more frequent PSAs? Do you need to get more MRIs? You know, what is the difference? In my mind, no difference, because the people that were monitoring with three plus threes were not really monitoring the 3 plus 3 to see if it's going to turn into something bad. That rarely happens. What we're monitoring is a man who's had one brush with prostate cancer and still has a prostate in place, and we want to make sure that a new tumor, if it occurs, a higher grade one, uh, that it gets detected at an early and curable stage. So this same mentality, I think, applies for 3 plus 4 and for 3 plus 3. We wouldn't be watching these 3 plus 4s if we didn't have a high degree of confidence that it's not something likely to spread or create a problem. And if it does, then we want to, of course, detect changes early. But in our experience, uh, doing a high-quality MRI once a year, checking PSA a couple times a year is adequate for tracking these people. Before I get to my next question, I just wanted to remind you that this September, we're having an in-person prostate cancer patients and caregivers conference here in Los Angeles, California. It's a great way to get your questions answered and join up with the prostate cancer community and learn from their experiences. You can find out more at PCRI.org. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel because when you do this, it helps us so much. It helps us get our videos out to people who need them all over the world. And if you would like to donate and join our cause, you can do so at PCRI.org forward slash donate. Now back to my video with Dr. Schulz. So one of the comments we had is from a man who's in the UK, and he's wondering if men who have disease in the apex of the prostate can still have brachytherapy because he went to a doctor and was told that because of the location that the seeds are going to burn the sphincter and the doctor's saying he wants to do ablation instead. Now the guy's looking at cyber knife. So what's your you know thoughts on this matter? My understanding is that uh, radiating over the sphincter, which is done routinely with both brachytherapy, cyber knife, IMRT, all these different radiation type methodologies, is quite feasible. And I'm not, I wouldn't go to that doctor if he says I can't do this. That's not the doctor to go to, obviously. The dosing uh, or exposure of radiation to the surrounding sensitive structures, the, uh, the bladder, the sphincter, um, the urethra, is something that has to be carefully designed. But I have never heard that uh, being a comment. I did, uh, in the, there was a large uh, randomized trial comparing IMRT with brachytherapy and it's called the ASCEND um, RT trial, which demonstrated better cure rates with brachytherapy compared to IMRT. But in that trial, they prescribed very high doses to the sphincter area, unnaturally high doses, and the, there was a somewhat higher reported incidence of urinary problems in the men that got brachytherapy in that particular trial. Experts that I talked to criticized the methodology that was prescribed when they did this trial, that they were overdosing the sphincter area unnecessarily. I've been sending patients for brachytherapy for years and uh, we've never made allowances for, uh, you know, trying to avoid treating diseases in the apex. But I've always vetted my brachytherapists, you know, to try and find the finest people in the world to do it. And I've had patients that were implanted 25 years ago. They're doing great today. So I don't agree with this doctor. I do agree that that doctor shouldn't do the implant, but there should be a competent brachytherapist who is able to treat this individual uh, from the information that I've been provided with. We have another patient and they have Gleason, you know, 7, 3 plus 4, and they have a 2.4 centimeter tumor on the right side of the gland and they think it may have breached outside of the prostate a little bit, but they really want to do focal therapy and they're wondering if this is an option for them. Quite possibly. I think the issues with focal therapy are not so much getting rid of the known tumor, it's uh, the confidence that there are no unknown tumors on the other side that you're leaving untreated. So I, I don't see any problem at all with focal therapy as long as people are thorough in vetting the untreated portion of the prostate, making sure that there's not something hiding over there, and that they get good regular follow-up because the untreated prostate over the ensuing years after treatment 
can develop a new cancer. And of course, you want to pick that up in a timely fashion. So patients that have focal therapy through my practice, we get an MRI annually and we treat them sort of like an active surveillance patient because there's real incidence of new tumors showing up. Uh, prostate cancer is so common. And, uh, and of course, you want to detect them. Do you have a preferred method of focal therapy for situations like this? Doctors who are referring people for focal therapy should simply be familiar with the skill of the doctor doing the focal therapy. So that is more important than the type of focal therapy. Uh, there's cryotherapy, electroporation, HIFU, Tulsapro, different forms of radiation, and others. The issue isn't how you destroy the tissue. The issue is how accurate and sensible is the doctor who's doing the actual treatment. The um, accuracy is important, uh, as it is with all types of prostate care. Uh, the problem is that focal therapy is a much smaller world than the whole prostate treatment realm. So there's many centers that are doing large volumes of whole prostate radiation, whole prostate you know, surgery is a whole prostate approach, all these things. And so uh, centers that are focusing on doing just focal therapy and have experience and who someone is able to, to uh, confirm does it well uh, is, I think, the most important thing. So we have a patient who had radiation therapy. He doesn't state what he had, but it seems like from the duration it would be beam radiation. And he also was on eight months of hormone therapy. His PSA is undetectable and he's wondering, you know, they told him that he needs to be on hormone therapy for like 12 to 18 months. Since his PSA is undetectable and he really does not like the effects of the hormone therapy, he's wondering if, since his PSA is undetectable, if he can get off of it. The historical norm for these people sounds since we're talking about three plus four, presumably this is an intermediate risk patient, uh, would be to give four to six months of supplemental hormone treatment. If the doctors are proposing 18 to 24 months, it raises questions as to whether there are some high risk features that are in the background of this patient's case, or if the doctors are just, you know, barking up the wrong tree. So if they go back and analyze their situation. There's a quiz on the PCRI website that you can find out, are you a teal or an azure, an intermediate risk or a high risk? And if it's a, a teal, then four to six months of uh, androgen deprivation is considered standard. So we have a 74-year-old patient with a Gleason 3 plus 4 equals 7, and his PSA is 25. And because his PSA is 25, the doctors are very concerned, and they want him to either do surgery or radiation. But he's saying he would prefer to do active surveillance because he doesn't want to deal with the side effects of the treatment. But they're arguing that, you know, because of that high PSA, he has to do it. And he feels kind of uneasy about going against his doctors. That's a hard thing to do. So is his high PSA really a factor in going against doing active surveillance? It probably would be against active surveillance, given that the criteria for what we call high risk is a PSA over 20. The problem is that the PSA is sort of a nonspecific indicator. What, why does this patient have such a high PSA? Does he have a humongous prostate? Does he have prostatitis? Does he have undiagnosed higher grade cancer somewhere? One of the nice things we have now in 2024 are these new PSMA PET scans to ensure that you're not dealing with undiagnosed cancer either in another part of the prostate or even outside the prostate. So that would be a logical thing to consider because there are non-cancerous reasons that PSAs run high. And if there is a cancerous reason that the PSA is running high, you want to know what it is. One little trick that we've done in some of these men with prostatitis is give them a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor such as Avidard or Proscar, Finasteride or Dutasteride. And in some cases, if it is background prostatitis, the PSAs will plummet dramatically. They come down to like three with minimal side effects. And so it's a diagnostic maneuver that can sometimes give peace of mind to the doctors and the patients and also determine if they're, uh, apart from what the PSMA PET scans can do, that we're not missing some other higher grade cancer that is driving this high PSA level. So we have another question from our comment section and it says, I'm 58 years old with a he and healthy with a PSA of 10.8. And I was recently diagnosed with a Gleason score of 7, 3 plus 4, comprising pattern of 4 in 10 to 20% and 50% of the core. My PSMA PET scans are negative and they show no evidence um, of metastasis. My doctor is asking me to either do surgery or radiation and hormone therapy. What should I do and how long will it take to metastasize? I like that question, how long will it take to metastasize? Because that's as we do this sort of analysis, we should be doing it in the back of our mind because that's the bad thing that can happen by postponing treatment the worst thing. Risk of metastasis for this sort of situation should be very low if it's a single core 
and it's 10 to 20% grade four, the risk of metastasis at 10 years may be less than 5%. These numbers need to be checked. Usually we'll send the pathology slides to a center of excellence to make sure that that 10 to 20% stipulation is accurate and uh, make sure that a good MRI is done to make sure that that's the only tumor and that the sampling, the, the biopsy, is representative of the, of the known visible tumor on the MRI. If all these things check out, it sounds like this gentleman would be a good candidate for active surveillance. And the question is, well, why are the doctors suggesting such aggressive therapy? And that's because historically, the idea was that anything above six is, is very dangerous. And uh, we now know that these uh, three plus fours with small percentage grade four are much less likely to metastasize. And it's gathering momentum in the prostate cancer world to consider active surveillance in these people. A question always comes up, should we do genetic testing, Prolaris, Decipher, and Oncotype to try and better get an idea of how aggressive this might behave? I'm not as enthusiastic for that technology now because not because the technology isn't good. It looks at the genetic makeup and gives you a sense in a, in a curve as whether this is more or less likely to metastasize. And they even provide percentages, which I used to enjoy seeing. You know, there's a 4% chance of spreading at 10 years or a 9% chance. The problem is, is that all three of these companies are using older databases that, uh, in which men were not supervised with MRIs. They didn't have PSMA PET scans. Uh, targeted biopsies were not done and uh, people were not watched as closely in many cases. So the predicted outcomes are much worse than what would be the case with a modern patient. So I'm a little concerned about doing genetic testing these days because sometimes people look at the clinical recommendations that are associated with the genetic information, and the clinical recommendations are all about treat, 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 be afraid, this is bad, which in my experience is never as bad as what these uh, people are reporting. I'm, I don't deny that the genetic uh, information provides you in a spectrum of whether it's compared to other prostate cancer patients, you're low, intermediate, or higher risk of spreading. But unfortunately, all three companies provide clinical recommendations about whether you should treat or not, which I believe is the physician and the patient's decision, not some report from somewhere that's using patients that were, you know, put on active surveillance that wasn't very active 20, 25 years ago. To your point with the genetic testing, when it comes to modern imaging, how do you utilize it? Because I think that a lot of patients, in fact, I was just talking to one yesterday where they got a low decipher score and it helped them not have treatment. And so I think a lot of patients really are being pushed to genetic testing. They appreciate it. They like the idea of it. But how do you contextualize it with a PSMA scan when it comes to the sequencing of importance? Well, I see it independent from PSMA PET scans. PSMA PET scans in men with three plus four should almost never find metastasis. So why are we even doing a PSMA PET scan? Well, you could argue that sometimes a tumor could be missed within the prostate. Uh, maybe the, uh, you know, on the random biopsy, we know 20% of the time random biopsies miss cancer. And so the uh, idea of a PSMA PET scan is uh, protective to make sure you're not making a mistake. We have other men that want to do active surveillance, like the case we talked about earlier, where they're running high PSAs. And uh, why? Is it because of undetected cancer or is it for some benign reason, which might allow you to do active surveillance? So I don't really see a connection between genetic testing and PSMA PET scans. I think they have independent usage. I would be more enthusiastic about genetic testing if they didn't incorporate all this additional falderal about whether you should treat or not. Yes, give me the statistical information. I do use the genetic testing when it's already provided, but I found that if I order it, that means I'm validating it. And when it comes back and says something like, you have to have treatment or you've got a you know 8% chance of being dead in 10 years, I find that to be very unhelpful and not accurate. So that's why I am not a big fan of ordering them although I'm happy to use the information once it's provided, and it's very comforting when it comes back as a low risk or a, or a, a more favorable genetic variant. So we have a patient who has a PSA of 10.3, and they have a Gleason score of 3 plus 4. Their next step that the doctor took was a CT scan and a bone scan, and this is kind of older technology. They didn't give him a PSMA, and he's wondering, what do I do? Well, if he's interested in active surveillance, and not everyone is. I mean, sometimes as men get older, they're no longer sexually active. I think that's the usually the main downside. If you're going to a center of excellence where they can deliver state-of-the-art radiation, it's not likely to harm you irreversibly except for the possibility, serious possibility, of erectile dysfunction. So I'm not advocating that everyone 
pursue active surveillance uh, if they're not uh, motivated to preserve their romantic life uh, intact. Assuming he is interested in preserving his uh, romantic life, then the scanning for someone who's eligible for active surveillance, uh, whether it's CTs, bone scans, or even PSMA PET scans, I think one could argue that they're all overkill. We think that the genetic nature of these low-grade tumors is so small that the incidence of false positives, you do a scan and you see a shadow and you go, oh my, oh my, oh my, there's a, you know, PSMA PET scans are known to have uh, non-cancerous spots show up on ribs all the time. So, oh, now do we have to biopsy the rib and, and uh, creates all kinds of consternation and complications. So uh, I don't know that he needs a PSMA PET scan, but a good MRI to make sure that there is not a second higher grade tumor in another part of the prostate, I think is essential as a basic building block in the active surveillance world. So step one, is this patient really interested in active surveillance? Step two, uh, get a good quality MRI to make sure that we're not missing something. So we have another comment that says, I took Dr. Scholz's comments on cells not changing Gleason score to pertain to low grade, meaning six. How does this question of cancer cells changing Gleason score patterns pertain to Gleason 3 plus 4? I currently have a 1.75 you know, cc lesion, and it's a 3 plus 4. 10% is Gleason 4. As the lesion continues to grow, will that 3 plus 4 remain that 10%, or will the 10% does it have the ability of becoming larger? I think the answer is it usually will stay the same, but his words saying as it grows addresses, I think, the primary metric that we've come to rely upon in these active surveillance patients, and that is whether or not the lesion on sequential annual MRIs grows or not. And so our policy has been refrained from doing any kind of biopsies, random or targeted, in men that have stable MRIs done at centers of excellence. However, if it grows, we advocate that a, a repeat biopsy be done to determine if there has been a change in the Gleason score. Now that change could have been because the first biopsy missed something that was higher grade to begin with, and now we're only starting to detect it. Or it could be, as they talk about, something from a lower grade level evolving into a higher grade. I don't think it really matters. What we're looking at, if it is growing, is we recheck. We get another targeted biopsy, and if the grade remains stable, then we're willing to live with that growth and continue on active surveillance. If the grade evolves into a higher grade, then it's probably time to talk about treatment. So there's a 66-year-old patient who has a Gleason score of 3 plus 4, and six years ago, before the prostate cancer diagnosis, he just was feeling like a loss of libido, and he started taking testosterone. And so now that he's been diagnosed with prostate cancer, you know, his testosterone levels are under 200 and he's still feeling that sense of just not having as much energy and loss of testosterone. And because of the um, 3 plus 4 diagnosis, he, he wants to take testosterone, but he thinks because he has that prostate cancer, he's concerned about it. He does have a family history and he's wondering if this is just, can he do active surveillance and can he take testosterone or will this really accelerate cancer growth? Generally, experts don't think it will accelerate cancer growth. And that's counterintuitive to what people assume. That's, I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say, I don't want to throw gasoline on the fire. A better analogy is, let's, let's not put more oxygen in the room. So we all need oxygen to survive. And if we take oxygen away, we die. Testosterone works that way as well. If you have no testosterone, the cancer cells die. But if you add more oxygen or you add more testosterone, you don't become more alive. You don't grow taller. And it is not generally believed that extra testosterone is going to accelerate or, uh, or create any problems whatsoever. Men who take testosterone need to monitor for something called polycythemia, which is a condition where you can make too many red cells and that can predispose to heart attacks and strokes. So there are precautions to taking testosterone, but it's not the prostate cancer that is the precaution. It's just overall vascular health that needs to be under close surveillance. So if this patient is truly an active surveillance candidate. We've just heard some generalities. Have they had their MRI? Um, have they, has the pathology been vetted at the center of excellence? Are these sequential annual MRIs truly stable? I don't have that information. But assuming that any individual meets the criteria for safe active surveillance, it is permissible in my practice to consider letting men have normal testosterone levels just like everyone else that's on active surveillance. 
It is so important to contextualize the information you're given. Whether you're getting back a genetic test and maybe it says something on the report, it's not that genetic testing isn't helpful. It can be very helpful. But the bottom line is you want to make sure that it's customized to your particular case and that you're asking your doctor what the meaning of those results are. A lot of times we see patients kind of come back and they think that they need to treat, you know, they active surveillance isn't an option, or maybe they think that, you know, they have to get this specific treatment and it can cause a lot of anxiety. The best way to combat anxiety is through education. So I would really encourage you to make sure you know your PSA numbers, you know what your scans are saying, you know what your Gleason score is, that you get a good understanding of this. And I know by watching these videos, you're already doing that research, so I really commend that. But when you're going and getting maybe a new piece of information, ask a lot of questions, advocate for yourself, and make sure that you feel comfortable with the information and that you understand it. And I wouldn't let something that maybe a report you've been given or something push you into treatment quickly. Again, you wanna contextualize that to your case. Now, another thing that Dr. Schultz talked about is the monitoring process. I have seen active surveillance patients, you know, who've been on active surveillance for quite a long time, forego proper monitoring and then something pops up in the meantime and then they're taken aback and they are very concerned and that's rightfully so. So whether you are a 3 plus 3 or a 3 plus 4 patient, any type of Gleason score, make sure that you're talking to your doctor, you're going to those appointments, you're getting your PSA checked, and you're doing proper monitoring because that monitoring protocol is there to protect you and give you more information over time as whether or not the information changes or not, whether or not you know there's more cancer or not. Obviously, we don't want that to happen, but the earlier you know, the better. So please make sure that you are monitoring. Another thing he talked about is the anxiety that can come from information and the need for education and how sometimes it's really hard to talk to your doctors about things that maybe you're not in agreement with. But when you're advocating for yourself, you know, the things that I have seen work best for patients is when there's an atmosphere of respect. This person is a doctor, they've worked really hard, they work with other patients, but you're also respecting your own choices and you're respecting your quality of life. And, you know, just try to keep calm, ask your questions, get a second opinion if you need to, and make sure that your medical team is working with you, but they are on your side. They are working for you. And I think it's very important to remember that in every situation when it comes to working with a medical team. Now, if you need help with your particular case, you can contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are patients who have had prostate cancer. They've experienced it and they know a lot about it and they can share their information and experiences with you. It's a great way just to build up your education and to get your questions ready for your doctor's appointment. So I would encourage you to reach out to them at pcri.org forward slash helpline. Also, if you'd like more information about prostate cancer in general, you can visit our website at pcri.org. Click the subscribe button because we come out with new videos just like this every week. And please remember most of all, you are not alone.